Hi, I'm Meg West, host of GardenWise, Santa Barbara's most informative show about sustainable landscaping. In this episode, we'll visit a variety of water-wise demonstration gardens throughout Santa Barbara County and see what sustainable landscaping techniques they're using. Who knows, you might get some ideas for your own yard. Our first stop, the Santa Barbara Association of Realtors, who recently traded in a boring old lawn for a dynamic and beautiful sustainable garden. I'm here at the Santa Barbara Association of Realtors with Daniel Wilson of Wilson Environmental Contracting. Hi, Daniel. Hello, Meg. Thanks for coming today nice and to be here. showing us this great garden that you just finished. Fun. Yeah. I know you've been working on it for a long time with the Association of Realtors as a way to show people a great lawn alternative. Why do you think the Santa Barbara Association of Realtors wanted to change their garden? Wow, that's huge. I mean, as we all know, curb appeal and selling houses is uh, really important and realtors give guidance to their clients on a good, quick, clean sale. And, you know, lawns have been an easy go-to. Santa Barbara Association of Realtors has a new executive director, Mr. Bob Hart, who looked out his window, saw the lawn and thought that we could do something more exciting and better than lawn and without all the resource consumption. And he realized that low maintenance, low water, more dynamic, more diverse, and more aesthetically appealing could work very well for curb appeal, not just in the short term, initial curb appeal, but the long term beautification of the land and the property. Right. So if you're selling a house, your realtor is one of the people that you're going to look to to give you advice about how to give it curb appeal and how to make a, a good quick sale, as Daniel said. So now that this is this beautiful garden instead of just another boring lawn, mm. what are you hoping that that shows people about, about landscaping? Well, we're hoping for people to understand that there's ways to have much more interest, much more color and diversity and attract hummingbirds and butterflies and um, just have an all around more appealing landscape other than just having a monotone green lawn that requires mowing every week and watering several times a week and fertilizers and petrochemicals and this is a way to just take a load down on the resource consumption and uh, improve the beauty. Absolutely, yeah, we're always trying to stress that on Garden Wise. We want people to get rid of their lawns as much as possible. Mm. And one of the main reasons, as you mentioned, is resource consumption. So in the past, there had to be a crew of people who came out here every week to mow it and fertilize it. And describe a little bit the difference in the maintenance in this garden versus a traditional lawn. Well, up until we finished this project, there was weekly maintenance here on the lawn, herbicides, weed, weed aside,s uh, mowing, hauling away the green waste, uh, sprinklers were on a couple times a week, quite a bit of water. This landscape has only been in for three weeks, but we expect, even right now, but in, when it is mature, we fully expect this landscape to basically require maybe a little bit of hand nip and tuck and pruning once a month or so, maybe once or twice a year, a couple hours to get in here for some shaping, uh, but we're really anticipating that this landscape is going to reduce maintenance by maybe 90, 95 percent. So huge savings in resources, huge savings in time as far as people maintaining it, um, decreasing any harmful chemicals that are going into our water system, all great benefits of this garden. And also reducing water consumption by probably at least 90 percent. Great. Okay, so we know that this garden is a massive improvement as far as resource consumption. Sure. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how it also actually conserves water in the soil with the stormwater aspects of this garden? Certainly, well, what we've done is we took a totally flat lawn and we just slightly shaped it and sculpted it. We used only hand shovels, just hand tools here and um, for the shaping part of it. And essentially what we've done is the water that falls from the roof and the gutters and the water on the landscape, we've contoured the soil just slightly so it flows away from the building. It flows through the middle of the landscape and it's got opportunity to just slow down, sink in, and provide some additional water for the plants, nourish the soil, and keep the water on site instead of flowing into the gutter, picking up the oil and petrochemicals and asbestos and running right down to Mission Creek and down to the ocean. That's right, so we want to keep the water on site as long as possible and these beautiful bioswales that you've created keep the water here and they also look really beautiful. So here's an example of a low maintenance, low water use lawn 
that has just as much curb appeal as a lawn, if not more, and saves resources at the same time. Another garden in the city recently underwent major upgrades to help demonstrate how stunning water-wise landscapes can be. Up next, we explore what changes were made to the iconic Alice Keck Park Memorial Gardens. Well, what we have done here, we have actually upgraded the Cirascape Gardens. So we had a garden here that was over 18 years old, and we decided it was time to renovate it because it was literally just getting tired tired, overgrown, and it looked weak. So we went ahead and uh, transformed it. In the last major drought that ended in the early 1990s, the park here had had a severe impact from the drought and from the uh, watering cutbacks during that severe shortage time. And the Parks Department approached uh, water resources and asked if, if we could talk about a partnership including funding to build into the park a water wise demonstration garden and we jumped on it we thought well what's well, perfect what a great idea because part of the water conservation program is to educate the public about the beauty and diversity of water wise landscaping and we are so fortunate in Santa Barbara to have so many amazing low water using plants. I mean there's hundreds and hundreds of them and to showcase them with such a talented landscape architect as Grant Castleberg working with the skilled staff of the parks department we just thought what a win-win situation we couldn't have a better one. Because of that particular drought what we ended up planting were plant material that could withstand droughts, plant material that didn't require a lot of water, plants that weren't cactuses, that were not succulents, plants that had varying colors, plants that would flower throughout the year, not things that would just all of a sudden bloom in the springtime. There's several beds here that actually bloom, particularly in the winter. It's, it's amazing to come out here. There's always something in bloom in this particular park. This Waterwise Demonstration Garden is based on microclimate, so there's different areas in the garden. There's a shady area and the sunny area, and we have shown those in different planting beds because part of having a very water-conserving garden is to irrigate in different zones. So if you have a shade area, you want to have that all on one zone of watering an irrigation station because those plants will take less water than the plants that are in the sun. Uh, so as you move through the garden you'll see there's a, these different microclimate areas as well as we wanted to showcase the different types of plants. So there's ground covers, there's bulbs, there's a dry creek bed area. We really are highlighting so much of the diversity and kind of the fun and dynamic gardens that you can have with Mediterranean low water using plants. So we have it set up so that people are able to pick out which plants they like and then buy those plants for their own home. So we have a sign over at the beginning of the park that has a map of the Waterwise Demonstration Garden and right next to it is a box full of plant lists. And those are constantly updated so all of the new beds and all the new plants are in there and they're all identified by a plant ID number. That ID number is found on the stake next to the plants and they're always plant in, planted in groupings so just look around for the one stake that's sort of in that plant area and that'll be identified on the plant list. There's also um, information on there in terms of how to prune it when it blooms, um, how much water it needs, uh, so you get more information than just the plant name. So when people have the plants picked out that they like, they can either go directly to the nursery because it has a botanical name and common name on there, or if they want more ideas, they can always look at our WaterWise Gardening website, which is on waterwisesb.org, and there's a full plant list there, as well as pictures of local gardens where they can click on plants and see if it's something that they want to incorporate into their own yard. So the takeaway is, you can have a beautiful, diverse, amazing garden in your home and hardly use any water. 
A water-wise garden saves more than 50% of the water than a traditional landscape with a more turf-dominated and a higher water using plants. So you're saving at least half of the water. And oftentimes it's more beautiful, more diverse. There's more butterflies and hummingbirds. There's more diversity as far as visual interest and height and um, artistic kind of sculptural elements. Some of these plants you can see are very visually interesting even without the flowers. And so if you have an area that's a mono planted one species area such as a lawn and you're not using that for recreational purposes then we highly encourage you to come down and take a look because really you'll be amazed at how beautiful your front yard or your side yard can look and you're saving money. See how simple it can be to transform your thirsty lawn into a beautiful water saving garden? I'll be back later in the show to take you to two more demonstration gardens further north. But first, we have a special watering tip from the city of Santa Barbara's water resources technician, Kathy Perret. Hi, I'm Kathy Perret with the city of Santa Barbara. Today we're going to check out the water percent adjust feature on a controller. It'd be great if you join me. Let's go in the back. Here in Santa Barbara, we do have seasons. They're not as exaggerated as on the East Coast, but our plants know when it's spring and it's fall, and we're the ones that are responsible to make sure that they get the amount of water that they actually need. In the spring, we still have moist air and residual moisture from our winter season, so we need to slowly increase the amount of water that we're applying to the landscape. In the fall, it's getting dark earlier, the plants are starting to go dormant, and we need to reduce the amount of water that we're applying to the plants because they're just not using it. So when we're looking at the spring and the fall water, and we call those the shoulder seasons, the summers obviously are hottest, the spring is a lot lower than the summertime, and then if you're looking at your curve, you're gonna come gradually up. You'll probably use the most water August, September, and October. You're gonna drop dramatically down in the amount of water that you're applying to your plants. We can do that with an easy one button adjust. The watering adjust feature or the seasonal adjust feature that you can find on your controller, it allows you to customize the amount of water that your plants are receiving depending on what the weather is doing. It's really easy to do. If it's warmer, you may need to increase the time. If it's getting cooler, like in the fall, you may want to decrease the amount of time. And by doing that, you take the seasonal adjust button and you change the percentage of the amount of time that you have currently scheduled. The number is actually posted on waterwisesb.org. One of the first things to do when you're gonna use your seasonal adjust button or your watering index is to actually look at your controller and see what you're watering in the summertime usage. So we're gonna come here, I look at my run time, and I'm running for 18 minutes. Well, let's imagine now that it's, I don't know, it's the fall, and we know it's getting dark at five o'clock, it's foggy at night, it's nice and cool in the morning, the plants aren't growing very much, I really only need to water maybe only 40 or 50 percent. So I'm gonna come down to this seasonal adjust percent here. This controller lets me adjust it every month, Yours may only do an overall, but let's go to, oh, let's just say it's April, May. We're gonna take ourselves here to October, November. At this point, it's watering 100%. That'd be the full 18 minutes. I'm just gonna take it down. I really only wanna water it 40% based on the watering adjust feature that I can look up online, 40%. So now I know that this is only gonna water eight minutes every time it comes on instead of 18. I put it back up to run and every single one of my zones are gonna water less than half of the amount of time you were watering in August. It's important, every time you can adjust this, you're applying just what the plants need, no more and no less than what they have. Most people overwater by five feet a year. That's almost a scary percentage, five feet of water that the plants aren't using because it's going deeper than their roots. If you go home and you look at your controller and you don't have that percent adjust feature, it's okay you can still do it. Look at your controller, see how many days a week you're watering. If you water three days a week in the summertime, that's your 100%, take one day off. Now you're watering 66% of the time. Usually that's gonna be your biggest shoulder month time, the fall and the spring. 
As you get closer to winter, you're going to water water a lot less. Only water once a week, and now you're watering at 33%. When you don't need to water even once a week, just turn it off, let it rain, and then as it starts to warm back up in the spring, slowly turn your watering back on for the most efficiency and the best plant health. To find this week's water percent adjust, visit waterwisesb.org. Up next, we have a thrilling segment for you, so put on your detective hat, because landscape architect and author Billy Goodnick is taking us to the scene of a crime in Crimes Against Horticulture. The story you're about to see is true. The location of these plants has been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city, Santa Barbara, California. Some call it paradise. Mountains and ocean views, classic architecture and exotic gardens. But drive down any street in any neighborhood and you'll find them there, sometimes in broad daylight. People perpetrating pointlessly pitiful pruning on peaceful plants. My name is Billy Goodnick and I run the Crimes Against Horticulture Division. Actually, there's no such thing, but wouldn't it be cool if there were? My mission is to help my community create beautiful, useful, sustainable landscapes. Plants that don't look like a bunch of UFOs, meatballs, and hockey pucks. Friday morning came suddenly. I'd been on a stakeout, hoping to find the perp responsible for a rash of juniper lollipops in the San Roque neighborhood. Maybe my triple espresso would kick in soon. I was typing an email when Jane jolted me awake with a new case file. After 30 years on this beat, I thought I'd seen it all, but this has got to be the most imaginative way of breaking plant code 2447B, subjecting plants to embarrassment. I mean, think about it. What if all the other bougainvilleas on the block looked like plants and you had to look like an Apollo space capsule? I can trace the origins of this crime back quite a few years when somebody decided to take a plant that's capable of scaling a four-story building and stick it in a two-foot space in a parking lot. These plants don't have an off switch, and since bougainvillea blooms on the new tip growth, it's even more ridiculous because you're constantly shearing off the growth that gives you the flowers that you bought the plant for in the first place. So it's just an endless cycle of work for no real payoff. Like the source of most crimes against horticulture, this is a case of putting the wrong plant in the wrong place. This plant just gets too big. It's capable of devouring a minivan and you don't want to turn your back on it because they just keep going. There's really no acceptable way to rehabilitate this plant. Best thing to do is to cut it at ground level, dig out the stump, find a beautiful low water using replacement. But before you select that new plant, you want to go through a little checklist. Does it like the area where you're putting it? This is a very sunny environment, so the plant has to withstand a lot of sun. What kind of soil do you have? Does the plant need good drainage or can it tolerate just about anything? And is it a plant that's going to exceed the space? Uh, if so, find a smaller plant that's going to live a happy life in that location. You can find a great selection of plants to suit all your needs at waterwisesb.org. Jane, would you mind filing? Thanks. And the streets of Santa Barbara are again safe for horticulture. Stay tuned, we'll be right back with more Garden Wise. It's time to turn it down. Honey, could you turn it down? Hey, can you two turn it down? Now that it's fall, it's time to adjust your sprinkler timer. Just check the watering percent adjust online. Then turn down your timer to match the percent. For this week's watering percent adjust, visit waterwisesb.org. Let's save together. Here's the story of a waterwise family who were bringing up two waterwise kids. As a family, they turn down their sprinkler timer according to the watering percent adjust. So turn it down, turn it down. Now that it's fall, it's time to turn your water down. For the watering percent adjust, visit waterwisesb.org. Welcome back. Now that we've seen examples of two great demonstration gardens in the city of Santa Barbara, let's head up north and see what Galita and San Inez have to offer. 
First, we'll visit an edible garden at the Goleta Water District and trace its journey from start to finish. So this being Goleta Water District, they wanted to show as many ways as possible for people to save water in their own landscapes. One way to do that is with a rainwater catchment system, and this right here is an example of that. We've got the rainwater tank, and it just comes right off the roof and into the gutter and spills down here and into the tank. Uh, one little element here that's nice to have for a rainwater catchment system is a first flush diverter pipe. And what happens here is when it first rains, you gotta imagine the whole season of soot and air pollution and dust and all that stuff is on your roof, especially if you have a composite roof. That stuff you don't necessarily want to get in the tank. So in the first flush, it'll come down and just flush down into the ground. And there's a little ball here that rises and falls. And then the main amount of the water goes into here, but just the first flush dribbles out into the ground so it doesn't get in and pollute your nice pure rainwater in your tank. So that's what's going on over here. This tank has baffles in it to make it nice and strong. It also has UV protection. That's definitely something to look for in a rain barrel because if they don't have UV protection, they can break. Uh, it's strapped in, so if we have an earthquake, then it'll stay nice and strong. And it's set on a gravel base, so it has a good footing and foundation. Okay, here's a part of the rainwater tank that I really, really love. It's a solar hose, and it's connected to the solar panel way on the top there on the roof. And all it needs is a really simple little pump. This has a tube that goes down in the tank. And the cool thing is when you press this button right here for three seconds, you get water out of your hose, water a plant. So the next thing we looked at in this design was what to do with the runoff water. So here in Santa Barbara, we have most of our rain in a big rain event. So it'll rain two inches in an hour or something like that. So this is gonna fill up real fast if it's a big rain event. And most of the water is actually just gonna flow off. And what happens here is this is the overflow pipe and it's a three inch pipe that then goes underground and it connects to a flow well that's in the middle of the landscape. And that flow well is just kind of a gravel pit underneath the ground. And it, it helps the rainwater recharge the groundwater. So in a normal overflow scenario, this, this, rain, this rain barrel might just overflow down into this bioswale and then run off the property. But the way that we avoided that was by piping the overflow to the flow well and then that flow well is at a low point in the landscape and it's close to high water loving trees. It's next to an avocado tree. So that avocado tree's roots are gonna grow down into the flow well and that's gonna provide water throughout the year. So let's go check out the flow well. So here's where the overflow pipe of the rain barrel actually terminates. And you can't see very much. It just looks like a, a drain in the ground. But what's underneath is a recycled plastic container. It's pretty large. It's about three feet tall by two and a half feet wide. It's a big cylinder and it's filled with gravel. And the pipe, three inch pipe from the overflow of the rain barrel plugs into that. So all the overflow from that rain barrel when it rains infiltrates into this area and fills up that gravel underground. So this design accomplishes not only bringing water from the roof down here to the flow well, but also draining this entire planting area and running it through the landscape in a way that's going to slow the water down and let it infiltrate into the soil. Here's an element of the garden that we've had a lot of fun with and also we've gotten a lot of questions about this. It's called a hugel culture and this is something I learned about at a permaculture conference and it was developed in Germany by a man named Sepp Holzer who discovered that if you bury big logs in the, in the earth and you cover them with soil that the logs actually act like a sponge and they keep water in the soil for a long time and they decrease the irrigation needs or the supplemental water needs of plantings. So what we've done here is we've made a hugel culture demonstration bed which is eight feet by four feet and we've planted herbs that are low water use herbs that are going to do well in a um, very well drained soil here. Uh, so these are here in our hugel culture. And then on the other side, we have a raised bed with the wood actually around the outside with similar plants with similar water needs. So what we're going to do is we're going to 
plant them both and then watch them over the next few years and see which one does better and test out to see if the hoog culture bed actually needs less water to produce the same or better growth in the, in the plants. So it'll be fun. We'll get back to you on that one. So since this is a demonstration garden, we wanted to show people as many ways as possible to conserve water in the landscape. And one important way is an ocean-friendly garden. And that's what we've demonstrated right here. This is essentially an infiltration basin. So the roof water comes into the gutter and the gutter actually pipes underground and comes out right here. And during a rainstorm, this will fill up with water and then the water will slowly settle and infiltrate into the earth. So this would be a good alternative if you're not up for the full rain barrel and rainwater catchment. This would be kind of a less intensive option for keeping that roof water on site as long as possible. Once the project was complete, we went back to take a look and talk to a couple of people about the inspiration behind the garden. I'm here at the new Goleta Water District Edible Garden Demonstration Site with Brooke Welch, who's a senior water analyst here at Goleta Water District. Hi, Brooke. Hi, Meg. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. Thanks for coming. Okay. So I'm curious, what was the inspiration behind this project? Well, one of the members of the Goleta Water District Board of Directors um, actually conceived this project. We have existing demonstration gardens on our site here in Goleta mm -hmm. that were installed back in 1999, and there's six different garden types featured in the demonstration gardens. And we recently refreshed those gardens with some new plants and walkways, so as a component of that project, our board member suggested adding an edible component to the garden. Something we didn't have yet, it's a popular garden type, and we had the space out here that wasn't being utilized, so it was a good opportunity to expand our existing demonstration gardens and provide another example for our customers and the community of um, how you can save water in landscaping. Right, so obviously as Goleta Water District, saving water is a pretty important thing to you guys. Right. How does this particular project, this edible garden, save water? There are a few things, um, but some of the things that are really easy to implement at home are just picking water-wise plants, plants that don't require a lot of water to thrive, um, drought-tolerant plants that can go without water at all, um, that's going to make a huge difference. The, in most households, the single largest water user is outdoor landscaping. Right. So having drought tolerant plants makes a huge difference in residential water conservation. So part of the point of this edible demonstration garden is um, to use some of that water to grow plants that you can actually eat right. that serve a purpose. Right. And you're saving money on water right. and you're saving money on food. Okay. So there's multiple benefits. So people can come to this site over on Puente and Hollister. This is your headquarters. They can yep. walk around all the different demonstration gardens. Absolutely. Check out different plants that they might want to use, water-wise plants specifically. And what are you hoping that people take away from it when they come and they visit and then they leave? What, what inspiration are you hoping to provide? We want people to see that water-wise gardens can be beautiful. I think a lot of people, and edible gardens as well, a lot of people have this vision of edible gardens being messy and hard to maintain um, and not pretty, and that's not the case. This garden shows you that you can have a beautiful yard with beautiful edible plants that are easy to maintain and use very little water, and that's the same with the rest of our demonstration gardens. I'm here with Sean Dollar, who's the Distributions Systems Superintendent at DWD. Hi, Sean. Hello. Thanks for talking to us. Yes, thanks for coming. Sean was involved in a lot of the oversight here while we were building this garden and helping to get the contractors in line and make sure things were happening in the right order and checking the work and stuff like this. So he's going to tell us a little bit about the process. I'm curious, what was here on this site before this was built? Uh, the landscape was pretty basic before. It was mainly all gravel kind of landscape and uh, there was a palm tree kind of right where we we're standing and uh, the existing rosemary and plum tree that's behind us was here pretty much that was that was it for the landscape so for the most part this was just a blank slate yes so now that it's all finished and the plants are growing how much maintenance does this garden require uh, the maintenance is minimal it's about an hour a week it uh, requires a little bit of vine training uh, some pruning uh, you know picking up leaves and picking the fruit when needed Okay, well, we're hoping to get some good fruit this spring. So the Goleta Water District Garden, all of their demonstration gardens are open during business hours. It's a great resource for people in this area to look at water-wise plants that they might want to use in their own garden. So come on by and visit. Next, we headed even further north to take a walk through the San Inez Valley Botanic Garden, located at Riverview Park in Buellton. 
Hi, I'm here with Puck Erickson, one of the many community members who's worked hard to make this botanic garden a reality. Hi, Puck. Hello, Meg. All right. So can you tell me a little bit about the inspiration behind this garden and how it got started? This garden was started because of Riverview Park, where we're standing right now when this park was developed. Federal Fish and Wildlife um, wanted some mitigation land set aside for habitat. And some of us felt that unless it was managed, it would really not be quality habitat. So we got together and formed a foundation to start the San Inez Valley Botanic Garden. So what was here before this garden? What did this land actually look like? <laughs> this land was not terribly inspiring. It was a severely degraded uh, dump site for spoils from construction sites and also erosion material from Highway 101 and 154 that was brought to the site by Caltrans. So it was, it's a myriad of soils from all over the county, this part of the county. Wow, so it definitely needed some help. It definitely needed some love. It needed some serious love. 99% of the maintenance done in this garden is done by uh, community volunteers, from Boy Scouts to um, volunteers through the teen court system, and for that reason, we allow things to um, be relatively dormant and we do a lot of mulching. We have a great event in March called Mulch Madness where we get um, all the free mulch from the county dump and bring it down and recycle it with lots of community members involved. Great, so because these are native plants, they don't require that much maintenance. Exactly. Also, plant spacing mm -hmm. is really critical. When we're planting, say, a toyon, we're allowing it to have 10 feet of growing space, so we're not out here hacking at things with clippers all the time. Absolutely. Right plant, right place. Very exactly. important, important thing we stress on GardenWise. So you've used exclusively native plants here? We only use native plants that's here. That's great. So that's obviously one big thing you're doing to save water because native plants have evolved to use only the amount of water that we receive through rainfall. What are some other things you've done to save water in the garden? Um, all of our irrigation is either drip or low gallonage, the new types of spray heads, say in our meadow. But also it's a more subtle message that people still come down to the garden in the summer when we allow things to go brown. And we're wanting to send out a very, subtle message that brown is good. This is the color of California. Um, ultimately, not every square inch of this garden will be bright green. Right. It's going to have the colors of a native landscape. Right, so um, instead of a lush green lawn sort of out of place in the middle of summer, thirsty drinking up all this water, this is what the landscape actually looks like in California in the summertime, which is brown. Exactly. Yeah, okay. So people, people can learn that that's natural and that's acceptable. Yep. So when people come to visit this garden, what do you want them to take away of their, from their whole experience here? We wanted this garden to be a little bit of a microcosm of the natural environments of the San Inez Valley, which are our real treasures. And so many people never really get out into our wilderness areas. And so we're hoping that this garden of native plants and plant communities will encourage them to take those baby steps to maybe get involved in this garden and then get brave enough to go out to Sedgwick and some of the other places like the Lake Kachuma Nature Center. I'm here with Eva Powers, who's another one of the community members who's worked hard to make this garden a reality. And she's involved with children's education projects here at the garden. You want to tell us a little bit about the program here? I would love to. This is the first year we're doing this, and it involves uh, our fourth grade elementary students uh, valley-wide, San Inez Valley. And in third grade, the students are learning about the Chumash village life. And so fourth grade, they're learning about the California missions. And what better place to learn than here at the Botanic Garden? So we invited San Inez Valley tribal uh, Chumash and the Botanic Garden members from here. It's a collaboration between the two groups and we invited the Valley students to come down here and learn as much as possible about our native plants and what you can do with those native plants. So this is the beginning. 
So the kids actually built the Thule hut we're standing in they front did. of? They yeah, did, yeah. That's incredible. It's our troll of a Thule hut. It's beautiful. And they also built the two um, uh, soft water kayaks that we have here, canoes, and they were used by the Chumash. And so the kids got to learn firsthand how to use our native plants to build the Thule hut and the Thule kayak. Are there plans to um, expand this Thule village? Oh, yeah. yeah. What, so do you see, what do you see in the future for I this idea? I see so much. <laughs> and so the, this is our first year. So we had just the fall group coming in here last week, which were 120 really exciting students. And come spring, we'll have another group coming in. And so they'll add another Thule a little bit further down. We're going to do our medicinal garden. Um, and who knows what else we have coming up. But, All right, I look yeah. forward to seeing. Thanks yeah. so much. As you can see, there are plenty of demonstration gardens throughout the county to give you ideas about how to make your garden more attractive and water-wise. So be sure to visit the one nearest you, or if you're feeling inspired, you can visit them all. One plant that you might see while you're visiting your local demonstration garden is Canyon Prince Wild Rye. It's a beautiful blue drought tolerant grass and it's the subject of this episode's Plant Rant. Hey, I'm here to talk about my favorite native grass, Canyon Prince Wild Rye. This grass is a selection of lamus that was found at the Channel Islands. It's a rhizomatous grass that spreads underground. The first thing I notice about this grass is its icy blue foliage that commands attention. This grass rarely gets taller than five feet, and in the summertime, it'll get a really nice plume here with a seed ball at the top that looks really lacy and, and moves in the wind. It's a really beautiful addition to this grass in the summertime. So these were planted in the spring, so that was about six months ago, and they've grown quite a bit in the past six months, and eventually this will fill in entirely with a sea of this blue grass. And that was the design intent. I worked on this project with Daryl Eichelberger of Arcadia Studio, and our intent here was to have this grass kind of bring to mind an, an ocean of blue as we are right across the street from the Pacific Ocean. So, are you convinced that Canyon Prince Wild Rye is the perfect grass for your garden? If so, head over to the nursery and start planting. Well, that does it for this episode. Remember, you are the agent of change, and together we can create beautiful gardens that also save water. There are plenty of resources online to help. Visit waterwisesb.org for more information or to view past episodes. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to call us at 564-5311 or visit our Facebook page. I'm your host, Meg West. Until next time, keep it green, Santa Barbara. 